if, if we know that this is what this land will allow, we'll look at it like that first. Because quite frankly, trying to arm wrestle land into something that it's not currently allowed to be is expensive and time consuming. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 199 with Justin Draplin. This is a wide-ranging interview with a visionary entrepreneur who is both developing tiny home communities and also developing technology for tiny homes and manufacturing those technologies in-house. So this is covering the full spectrum, or not the full spectrum, but uh, as we talk about in the interview, Justin is going vertical with tiny house development. And we'll also talk about why Eclipse homes are not called tiny homes. They're actually called cottages. Justin actually remarks that that tiny home is a bit of a swear word in the office. So we'll dig in to that. We'll talk about Justin's mentality when it comes to finding land for development and also just some of the features of these impressive small homes. I hope you stick around. But before we get started, did you know that I personally send a tiny house newsletter every week on Tuesdays? It's called Tiny Tuesdays, and it's a weekly email with tiny house news, interviews, photos, and resources. It's free to subscribe, and I even share sneak peeks of things that are coming up, ask for feedback about upcoming podcast guests, and more. It's really the best place to keep a pulse on what I'm doing in the tiny house space and also stay informed of what's going on in the tiny house movement. To sign up, go to thetinyhouse.net slash newsletter where you can sign up for the Tiny Tuesdays newsletter. And of course, you can unsubscribe at any time. I will never send you spam. And if you ever don't want to receive emails, it's easy to unsubscribe. So again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash newsletter. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy next week's Tiny Tuesdays newsletter. All right, I am here with Justin Draplin. Justin Draplin is the very definition of a serial entrepreneur. He has spearheaded several business ventures from children's superhero capes to his eco-friendly tiny homes. When he's not busy being a husband and dad, Justin can be found on site at any of his tiny home communities. He oversees everything from design to manufacturing, ensuring that every piece of the homes are up to standard. Not only is he bringing tiny home culture to Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, he's bringing jobs too. The manufacturing plant is nestled right at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains, employing people from all over the community. Draplin's innovative ideas and passion for his community has blossomed into a business that has gone above and beyond what he ever considered. Justin Draplin, I'm excited to have you on the show to talk about these Eclipse Cottages. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Can you tell me a bit about about the project, how you got into it? Yeah, I mean, we got into uh, tiny homes. I basically found a very pretty piece of land and wanted to do something there. Um, It was close to town on a biking path and Mm -hmm. um, came across tiny homes. I mean, I knew of tiny homes, um, but got more into them as somebody recommended I do them here. And um, so I started developing the the land um, to bring in tiny homes. And then from there, I started looking at building my own. Uh, Mm -hmm. My dad was a builder, uh, a fireman by trade, but built homes on the side. So it always been interesting to me. So I'd always been researching, um, you know, new techniques and trying to stay up on the latest and greatest um, construction methods. And so uh, when COVID hit and uh, I was starting to have problems getting product, I decided that that would be a good time to uh, start building my own. Yeah. So what when you say you were having trouble getting product, what, you know, what kind of business were you in before? Well, it was with the tiny homes. Okay. So we were, okay. I developed the land. Um, we were bringing in tiny homes from other builders. Okay. Um, and we were just hitting just these insane delays, um, yeah. where we had a, you know, we'd have a delivery date. They push it back like three months, then they push it back another month then they push it back another month. And, uh, it was kind of one of those things of, well, if I have to deal with that kind of delays, I might as well be building them myself. Now, obviously yeah. we've hit our own delays as well. Cause the delays are a lot of it's with materials and labor and stuff like that. But, um, figured if I got to deal with delays anyway, I might as well spend that time doing something constructive. So, yeah. 
So these homes are are 399 square feet. Can you give our listeners a sense of of kind of the dimensions of the home? Like what how does that translate out yeah. into livable space and then what what are the kind of general what's the layout? Yeah, so um we basically build them all at about 11 foot eight wide by 34 foot two inches long. Um, and they're all a pretty basic layout. You go in the front door on the skinny side, right. Or hot mm-hmm. dog ways yep. as I tell yep. my kids. And, um, you go on the one side and you walk into the living room, which is just an open space, which goes right into the kitchen. Um, which continues that open space. So it keeps as much open space right when you walk in um, as possible. Um, right on the other side of that wall, you have a bathroom. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of the bathroom is the bedroom. Nice. Um, a cro- kind of a cro- There's a hallway that goes in front of the, the, um, the bathroom. And on the other side of the hallway is where you could put your laundry center. So it's not a whole room, but you could put your laundry um, stuff there. And then there is stairs from in the living room, um, stairs that would go up into a loft that can be used either, either as storage or an additional sleeping space. Okay. And there, so for people listening who want to see these homes, they've been beautifully photographed and I will put pictures up on the show notes page, which will be at the tiny house.net slash one nine nine. Um, and so, you can see these pictures if you're if you're not driving your car or walking down the street. If you want to take a look at them while we talk, you're you're definitely welcome to do that. Um, so, in terms of sleeping spaces, how many bedrooms um, are we talking here? Yeah, so it depends. Um, you know, we we do count the one room on the main floor as the kind of the master bedroom because okay. most people don't like climbing up into a loft to go yep. to yep. to to go to bed, but. Um, you know, the, the loft can be used for whatever, you know, you can use it as a bedroom, can use it as storage, whatever mm-hmm. that person wants to use it as. Mm-hmm. And, and that, um, you know, when I would say most of my listeners are thinking of a loft, they're thinking of a tiny house on wheels. They're thinking of a ladder, not being able to stand full height. Um, this loft looks quite a bit more like an actual second floor. Yeah. Um, and so, and they can go to our website too, to see yeah. some of this stuff, which is www.eclipsecottages.com. Uh-huh. Um, we do have a vaulted loft option. Okay. Um, so it doesn't, they don't have to get the taller loft, but we do have a vaulted loft option, which will get you, you know, pretty much anybody will be able to stand up in the middle of it. Um, mm-hmm. maybe not on the sides cause of the pitch of the roof, but, um, it does, it does give you a lot more, the feeling of a lot more livable space. Yep. Um, so we do have people putting offices up there, bedrooms up there. Um, it just makes it a lot more livable. Nice. So let's talk about the kind of the efficiency and the, um, just some of the things that I mentioned in the intro around the, the insulation and the thermal breaks and, and all that. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're building uh, what, what basically amounts to the most net positive home mass produced that currently exists. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we do every single home that we built has a full solar roof. Um, so not, you know, it's, it's, it's our own um, proprietary product. Um, so we are getting it manufactured ourselves, mm-hmm. um, but it is an integrated steel solar roof, um, cool. as opposed to a roof with solar panels on top, it's Got actually it. integrated into the roof. Um, so every home comes standard with that. Um, every home comes built with steel, um, SIP construction, which is okay. a structurally insulated panel. And that allows us to, um, have a higher degree of insulation, Um, you know, that having that full vapor barrier, if you think of traditional construction, um, everywhere that you have a stud, which is usually 16 inches on center, um, is basically like a vent. Um, so you, you, even, even if you go bigger, if you go a six inch wall and you're using traditional construction, you've got a vent every 16 inches, Mm -hmm. which really hurts the insulation, no matter how thick you put your insulation, you're still going to have those vents where that wood is because wood is a terrible, terrible insulator. Um, so what, what ours is, is, is basically creates an entire break of thermal um, protection. Um, so fiberglass or closed cell foam um, 
is between the outside and the inside everywhere. There isn't even so much as a yep. nail or a screw that pierces through both sides. Um, everything gets gets secured into insulation. Got it. Yeah, yeah. And and our listeners are definitely familiar with the concept of of thermal bridging. If if I've done my job, it's something that that we talk about a good amount, and and they've heard about SIPs too. And I I think you know what's what's interesting and unique here is that we're seeing that this can be applied to homes that are slightly bigger than than a tiny house on wheels and you can you can wind up with something even at 399 square feet that that really looks quite spacious and and not mm-hmm. that a tiny house on wheels isn't livable but this this kind of has quite a bit more space than than your home on wheels yeah certainly um, now ours do come on wheels to be okay. clear um but yeah, most people are going to put them in place, you know, put some skirting on them. Yeah. Um, make them look more like a traditional home. Mm-hmm. Okay. So these are, deli- so you deliver them on wheels. Uh, correct. Yep. And then is the, is the trailer, the wheel system integral to the house or is that something that kind of gets taken away? Uh, up to the end user. Okay. Um, you know, we, the communities that we manage, we usually just leave them on. Um, okay. Not, not that anybody can see them. Um, but if you take them off, then you got to do something with them too. So got it. Got it. What is the, so, and these are, you said 11 foot eight wide. So I would imagine that that transporting Mm -hmm. one isn't quite as simple as just, you know, having the right pickup truck and hitching up your tiny house and going, what is, what is, uh, involved in the moving? Yeah. I mean, you have to hire a professional company to do it. Um, you know, the, these are, you know, you're talking 15 feet tall as well. So um, there's special permitting that needs to be pulled to, to, to move one of these. You, you want to yep. make sure you get professionals involved if you're, if you're going to be doing that. Yep. Yep. So um, what is, so, so there's both Eclipse tiny homes and then there's Eclipse villages. Um, well, so it's, so ours is Eclipse cottages. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Eclipse cottages. Don't use the tiny homes word. Tiny homes is a swear word around here. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, but eclipsecottages.com and then eclipsevillages.com. Okay. Uh, why is tiny homes a swear word? Um, there's becoming a negative connotation in the industry. Okay. Um, especially when you get to the development side. Okay. So when you're doing a community um, and you call it a tiny home community, it is triggering people to think of mobile home parks, of huh. something that's run down, um, transient, um, and, and so we're trying to um, use our own verbiage so it doesn't turn into that. Um, and, and the other thing is, tiny homes is such a broad term. Yeah. Um, I mean, it can be applied to you know a conversion van. That, sure. You're, you're living out of all the way to a stick built 400 square foot home. So it's such a, it's such a broad term. You, you, you almost leave it open to so much interpretation based on who's hearing the term. Right. Um, right. And that just, that just doesn't leave. I, I, that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, you know? that makes sense. So cottages is just something very much more specific because it, it means a small home. Correct. I mean, I think it, I think there's more consistency in, especially with what we build, we feel like that fits better with what we build. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, a tiny home people, you know, I, I have people that ha- live in like thousand square foot homes that say they live in a tiny home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got, you know, 150 square feet on, a, on wheels that say they're a tiny home. Well, okay. Who are you talking to? Um, and that'll determine what, what that tiny home word means. Got it. Um, so yeah, we've, we've really nailed down on Eclipse Cottages and our communities we're calling Eclipse Villages. Okay. So tell me, uh, tell me more about the communities was, you know, as a, as a small home or cottage builder, I won't say tiny home, but yeah. I'm sorry, the name of this podcast is the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast. So we can't change that one. Yeah. Um, no, fair enough. You, but see, that gives you a wide audience, right? Right, right. and you we can, cover. You can talk to the schooly people, and you can talk to the yurt people, and and we do. Those are all kind of t- tiny houses. So yep. when we yep. say a tiny house community, if people start thinking schoolies and yurts, it 
it doesn't work for for what we're trying right. to build. So. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. So d- what you know, kind of what came first, the the village or the cottage? The village. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. And are these um, bring your own home villages? Are these you know short term uh, rentals, long term rentals? Yeah. How do you do it? We're working on a whole bunch of them right okay. now. So we are actively trying to partner with people across the um, lower forty eight. Mm-hmm. To do more villages, um, we have some in process that are basically just primary residences. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some that will allow short-term rental. We have some that are basically going to be more like a boutique hotel, um, where all of them are going to be more more rental options. So we're not. Um, I don't know. I feel like there isn't really a cookie cutter. I mean, there is, you could make it a cookie cutter and say, we're only going to do them this way. Mm -hmm. Um, Our focus from the development side has been like, well, let's find really cool pieces of land. Mm -hmm. Um, So that means, does it have mountain views? Does it have a pond or some creeks? Is it wooded? Is it close to a downtown Um, or like Creek walks on a bike trail? Like um, I feel like that's such a part of it because we're, we're about abundant living. Right. So part of what a, what a tiny home or a cottage or small living does was allows you to live a more abundant life. You can right. spend more time living your life as opposed to paying, you know, making money to pay for your expensive bills or clean your home or cut grass or, you know, all those things. Um, so part of that is, well, where do you live then? Where are you living? Um, anybody could take, you know, 30 acres that's flat and, old farmland and build a tiny home community. But Mm -hmm. in my mind, nobody would actually want to live there other than there's not a whole lot of tiny home community options Mm -hmm. out there. So Mm -hmm. they might live in that one. Um, Whereas we're focusing more on, well, let's find the right dirt. Let's find pretty land, good locations, and then we'll look at it and then we'll see what makes sense for it. Got it. Got it. And so how many villages are, are operating now or are in the works right now? Uh, we have four where we already own the dirt and mm-hmm. we're developing in the process of developing right now. Nice. Um, there's another, let's say four that we're kind of in negotiations with either people own the dirt. Cause we get a lot of people that bring either capital or land uh-huh. um, into this. And they say, well, we want to do a community. Um, you know, they, I, I, I am becoming a little bit known for where we're at because we're building kind of cutting edge tiny homes. Um, you know, I've got more tiny home community lots. I've got over a thousand community lots in development, which wow. is, you know, more than anybody else that I'm aware of. Um, so, which means we've got more and more people coming to us saying, Hey, we want to do this, but we want to work with somebody that knows what they're doing when it comes to these types of communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got people that bring us dirt. I got people that come with money and say, you know, I, I want to invest, you know, $3 million and do a tiny home community. Um, we have people that want to convert. I, I'm talking to somebody that wants to convert an old mobile home park. Um, yeah. I've got another one that wants to convert an old um, campground, like, um, you know, summer camp kind of yeah. place. Yeah. Um, but they don't know where to go on this stuff. You know, we have some people know mobile home communities, but they don't get the difference between tiny homes, which it's a big difference. Anybody that's doing a mobile home community that tries to just start putting tiny homes in it fails miserably because Mm -hmm. that connotation that mobile home parks have, you know, is for a reason. And so the people that are living in tiny homes um, or our cottages, you know, it isn't, they're, they're aspirational, right? Mm -hmm. This is a choice that this is how they want to live their lives. And as a general rule, you know, people in a mobile home, um, it really isn't like a life's desire to live Mm -hmm. in a mobile home. Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of a, this is just where I'm at in my life right now. This is all I can afford or or those kind of things. Not necessarily, I'm, I'm making some gross generalities, um, but that just, it, the, the mentalities of the two groups are just very, very different. Yeah. I, I can see the distinction there and, and that, that you're, you're trying to create a place that is both affordable and also aspirational. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So in terms of the, the cottages themselves, um, you're producing them 
for yourself, but but they're also available to individuals. Like if, if- uh, so they, they will be okay. um, right now, we're just so backlogged that we're only building for our developments. OK, um, so somebody that does want our cottage today, you know, if they want it within the next year, um, would have to mm-hmm. be coming into one of our de- developments. OK, OK. Which and is then- another reason people are trying to do developments with me, because, you know, if you want my cool home, right. you can only get it by doing a development through doing so. a development. Interesting. And so you're kind of that it sounds like you really have a lot of of a convergence of of expertise here both the building of the cottage and then also the the development end of things yeah i mean and they they do go hand in hand um to a large degree mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. more more so than most people realize well i think i think anybody that has a tiny home realizes it because they got to find a place for it and then sure. they realize they can't find any place for it right right um you've kind of gone vertical you've uh you're yeah. you're handling both the the building of the home and the the parking of the home correct yeah um in terms of the um the insulation and the r value um can we get into the specific numbers? What What is the R value of the walls, ceilings, and floors in, the, in these homes? Yeah, so um, right now what we're doing is an R35 okay. all the way around. Okay. Um, so that's going to be your wall, ceiling, floor. Um, now, once again, that's of a closed cell um, mm-hmm. spray foam, mm-hmm. full thermal break. Um, so when you actually compare it to, you know, uh, any kind of traditional construction, it's just it's just sure. really insane the difference. Sure, yeah, and, and that that does make sense. And you know, as somebody who stick built, you know, I, I was an amateur builder, twenty twelve, kind of early to the tiny house movement. You know, I have a stick built tiny house that's spray mm-hmm. foamed, but you know, it's it's only four inches of foam, and then there's a stud every sixteen inches. So um, mm-hmm. it's not drafty, but it's the floors especially are are quite chilly. Um, so I, I certainly think about SIPs and those, you know, people who are getting that constant insulation with no thermal bridging and I, my feet are jealous. Yeah. Um, is there, you know, are there options for, you know, if you say we're going to put one of these houses in, in Vermont where, you know, the, the residential energy code, um, you know, says that ceilings should be a minimum of our 49 for example or for flat ceilings r38 would there yeah. be an option to to upgrade and kind of do thicker ceilings yeah so not right now okay um once again we're just so backed up that we're really we're so limited on even the modifications that we're doing you know yeah. it's like yeah. this is this, this is the rectangle <laughs> mm-hmm. um that's it this is where your windows will be yeah um we let them pick some colors but other than that um we're trying to standardize just because we need to ramp up so many. When you get into those custom builds, it, it just it just delays everything, and it's yep. just yep. way more communication with a, with a customer um, on all their tweaks, and then reviewing plans and sign offs, and it's just um, eventually um, you know we'll have more options such as that. Um, but right now we're we're just trying to streamline so we can get these homes in more people's hands. Right. Right. So what I would say that most of my listeners are familiar with um, a SIP that has OSB, you know, mm-hmm. so a plywood on both sides. Mm-hmm. These mm-hmm. Do these metal SIPs have that ply layer and then the metal or no. is it just like a sandwich of steel insulation steel? Yeah. 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 So it's basically two frames right now is what okay. we're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, so you've got an, an interior steel frame and an exterior steel frame um, and f- nothing but a foam between them. Um, so it's a lot of extra work. Now we are working on a modification to this, um, which is going to use um, less steel, have better engineering, mm-hmm. um, but also keep a thermal break. So I don't want to get too much into it because we're exploring patents on the technology and on okay. how we're putting it together. Um, but we're looking at, uh, basically redesigning the, uh, a sip, uh, uh, with steel, um, and, and neither of them use any, any wood at all. Okay. Um, you know, partly with that OSB is you run into what 
you know, what chemicals were used on that OSB? How flammable is that OSB? Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of bug food is that? Um, you know, when we're going with the steel and just insulation, the benefits are just so much greater. You avoid, you know, all of those problems. Like I said, you know, the fire, you know, we've got, you know, our walls are flame impossible. You know, you're never going to catch these things on fire. It's all right, steel right. And, and, and fire retardant foam. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about bugs and termites and all that kind of stuff getting into this. Um, you don't have to worry about off gassing, um, mm-hmm. the, the harmful chemicals that, that come from that. Um, so it's just trying to eliminate as much of those chemicals and, and toxins. And, um, and it's interesting because the more we focus on just what's the best option, not what's the cheapest, mm-hmm. not what's the most profitable, not what's the, you know, trying to not take shortcuts, we end up saving money. So like, just because our envelope is so tight, you know, we power the whole home with a single zone 9,000 BTU mini split, Mm -hmm. Um, which means, you know, you're saving a ton of money on heating and cooling your home, not only from a installation standpoint, you know, the amount of equipment needed to heat and cool that space, but from an operational standpoint, you know, yeah. we have a 23.5 SEER um, unit heating and cooling this whole home. Um, so you end up saving money in areas that you, uh, you know, kind of weren't expecting to. Got it. Yeah. So one thing that that I've certainly drilled in for my listeners and, and we've talked about on the show a lot is, you know, we're building these these very small, very tight homes and that it's very important to have mechanical ventilation, you know. Uh, yep. uh, so what, what mm-hmm. kind of ventilation systems are you putting in? Uh, we put an energy recovery ventilator in every single unit. Nice. And, and um, I appreciate that because I know that there are builders who make that optional. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm of the belief that that shouldn't be an option. That's like letting someone buy a car without seatbelts. <laughs> Well, when you build like we do, yes, yeah. right. When yeah. you when you use the 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 full with the thermal bridging and the air tightness of the of the product, you're asking for problems. Yeah. Um, it it is interesting though. You know, back in the day when we constructed, we didn't have breathing issues because like the whole air, the whole house breathed all the time, mm-hmm. right? There wasn't insulation. It was like you're you always had fresh air. Yep. Um, yep. And now we've gotten to the point where we've tightened it up so much that now we have to intentionally bring in fresh air. Otherwise we could get sick or yep. you could grow mold or mildew or, I mean, that's another thing with ours, with the steel and the insulation, like it is mold and mildew resistant. Um, but once again, though, if you get humidity in there and you don't have a way to get it out, mm-hmm. um, you're going to have problems. I right. mean, you might, you might not have mildew in your walls cause our walls are so good, but all your furniture is going to have mildew in it. Right. Right. Um, so managing that humidity is a big, big part of it. Absolutely. And I mean, if you live in it, there's going to be humidity just from your breathing, from your cooking, a your shower, pets, your yep. plants, the shower, mm-hmm. everything. Fascinating. How, how many of these, um, cottage models have, have you built? So we've only completely delivered four. Uh Uh, We just launched in September. Um, we've got, um, we're, we're trying to ramp up as quick as, as quick as we can. So Mm -hmm. we're, we're, um, ramping up our inventory of product. Um, we just announced some hiring, um, you know, we got over 160 applicants in the last week and a half, which is pretty amazing. Fantastic. Um, you know, we need to get to the point. Um, I want to, I want to be putting out one a day in 18 months. That's kind of my goal. Okay. Um, got a long way to go to get there. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's doable. Uh, yeah. you know, it, doing all of this in the midst of a national pan or international pandemic, um, created its own challenges, but I figure if we can do it now, um, sure, sure. you know, when things straighten out, we're, we're, we'll just be rocking and rolling. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I, and looking at the, some of the pictures, um, you know, the, the model, I think I saw on the dwell article, which I'll link to, you know, it has a nice deck that kind of is wrapped around. Is that mm-hmm. something that was built kind of after the fact, after the house yeah. was placed? 
Okay. Yeah, and that one, the whole that entire deck was actually built after. Okay. Um, the the homes that we're delivering right now do have a ten foot covered front porch built on. Okay. Um, and then anything after that, you know, the wraparound, back decks, that kind of stuff would get added after. Got it. Um, once again, that's one of those things that um, we'd like to add more on. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the sake of expedience, um, 10 foot covered front yeah. porch, most people are pretty happy with. Um, yep. So that's that's what we're working on now. And then the in the photos it almost looks like the house is on a concrete foundation, but, but you mentioned that, that that's just skirting. Correct. Yep. That house is actually on wheels. Okay. And what, um, you know, is there a concrete pad that you pour there? Like how do you prepare the site? You know, cause it, no, it looks, it's just, um, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the company that we hired to, to level them, um, uh-huh. uses cinder block piers. Okay. Um, and then there, there are, um, use hurricane straps to, you know, make sure everything's secure and down, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the home's not going to blow over and, you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, and once all that's done, then yeah, we'll actually, we actually frame in, um, around the exterior and then use a hardy board cement product, um, to skirt it. Yeah. And that, I mean, that hardy board looks even though it's not like a particularly attractive product on its own, it looks right for a, for a small house because you expect mm-hmm. to see kind of below grade, below the first floor, you expect to see concrete. Um, so that yeah. really kind of speaks the language of, and, and, you know, it fooled me. I thought that these were site built or that they were yeah. at least, you know, maybe built somewhere else, but then brought and put on a, to a concrete foundation. Yeah. Well, very cool. Um, what else, you know, I, um, I feel like I've asked you about a lot of the systems in the house, um, you know, the insulation, the ventilation, is there anything else in the house that you're particularly proud of or excited about that you want to talk we, about? So we just standardized, um, we just made the call this last week. Um, we're going all wireless switches, um, on okay. all of our homes. Okay. Cool. Um, so every single switch, um, you know, basically we'll give people a box of buttons, Yep. You know, you can um, move them around, the which is, yep. Put them wherever you want. Yep. Um, yep. now we're working on, um, those are just RF right now. So you can't control them with your phone. Yep. Um, but we're working on fine tuning the, um, the app to control the Wi-Fi. Yep. Um, so the, the goal is to eventually switch those over to a Wi-Fi, uh, functionality. Nice. So you can control every switch in your home with your, with your phone without, having to go and buy an extra whatever download this or yeah. anything like that. So. That's fun. That's fun. I know the, uh, Lutron Caseta is a really nice system. I don't know what, which one you're using, but they, they do a good job. Um, uh, so we're actually, we're actually, uh, direct manufacturing those as okay. well. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Very so, cool. I mean, part of our whole model is like, we're going to have the volume, right? right. So, you know, like Tesla and their cars, right? Yeah. They can do batteries in house because they're doing the volume. They're their biggest customer. Yep. Um, and and so that's the same thing. So we're doing the solar roofing in house. We're doing the uh, wireless switches in house. We're going to be doing our own steel sips in house. Um, and then our goal is not only will that make our product better, um, but we'll also have the opportunity to sell that product. Right to other builders. So like even our solar roofing product, I've already got two other tiny home builders interested in that product, um, as well as some traditional builders, yeah. um, interested in that product. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's just going to be a huge market for us. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that that's, it's quite a vision, but it's, it makes a lot of sense. Um, where, um, so uh, Members of my online community, Tiny House Engage, are able to kind of listen in live. Um, yeah. And there are a couple of questions from the chat that I wanted to pass along, which is, um, where are you building and do you offer factory tours? Um, so no factory tours. Okay. Um, we don't really have much of a factory right now, quite honestly. Um, we are building in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, people are welcome to come by and take a little tour. Um 
there's just not much to see yet. We're looking at um, building an additional facility here. Okay. Um, and then we're going to be building a, we're in the middle of pulling per- permits on another building down off of I-95. Okay. Um, which is a few hours from here, but it's still in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're looking at starting to build there as well. And, um, and now we're, once we get those two locations more operational, then we're looking at um, trying to build a bigger plant. Um, and at that point, we'd probably have, you know, be, be better equipped to do tours, but sure. that's going to be more of a giant factory where we've got our, our, you know, we start manufacturing our solar roofing in-house in that plant. Okay. We have our homes being produced in that plant. Um, we have our steel panels being produced in that plant. Um, so that's going to be a whole, you know, that's whole next level stuff. So we'll be working on that capital raise probably on the, towards the end of this year nice. to do that. Nice. Um, another question is the wiring in the home, all AC, or is there some DC wiring to tie into the, the solar? Uh, right now we do convert it all. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think I'm not an electrician by any stretch of the imagination. So I may not be the best person to answer that intelligently. Uh Um, but because it all goes into a battery pack and is fed directly into the breaker box, um, it all goes through that same point of contact. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that, that often is, is what ends up making the most sense from a complexity perspective, but, um, Mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can gain some efficiency if you do those DC lights and things, but it it adds a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. Well, one thing that I like to ask, you know, all of my guests is what are two or three resources that, that have inspired you or helped you out along the way that you recommend? It sounds like, you know, if you have anything around development or entrepreneurship, it sounds like you, you've got some experience there and maybe some resources to share. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I can that I can point to anything out externally okay. um, that was like, oh, that was it. I feel like to have success in entrepreneurship, it's got to be mostly driven internally. Uh-huh. Um, and that goes to um, not, you, you know, there is no golden key, right? Mm-hmm. There isn't a one or two resources. You can do it if you only have these one or two resources. And quite frankly, Anybody that says that they're trying to sell you something, sure. right? They're making money on their book or whatever. And it's quite frankly, it's all a lie. Mm-hmm. Um, you need like thousands of resources. Yeah. And so it's more about your mindset um, that you're going to go out and pursue this stuff um, because there isn't, you know, even doing a development, like every single municipality, the rules are different. Yeah. So how is somebody going to tell you how to do it? community where you're at yeah when they have no idea how to do it where you're at without yeah. doing a whole yeah. bunch of research now there's some things that carry over but i think it's more um for people to look inside themselves and just start pursuing everything that they, that they can yeah um, like i said i don't have myself one or two individual resources um it's just constant resources. It's yeah. always next. It's yeah. always like, oh, this was great. What's the next thing I can read? And I get that that's what you're trying to get from me. <laughs> like, what are, what are some good nexts? Um, but it's just, I spend a lot of time Googling what I want to, what I want to search for, sure. um, for where I'm at. Cause every, you know, it just depends on what you're, where you're at, what's going to yeah. hit. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the focus is just what do you, what do you need right now? That's what you need to pursue. You don't need another generic solution. You need to be pursuing answers. Yeah. And so is that, for example, you, you mentioned this a second ago and it it kind of sparked the follow-up question for me is like when you are, you know, looking at some land in a particular town, how do you approach doing that research around those municipal rules? Do you, yeah. do you hire a consultant? Mm-hmm. Do you just spend a lot of time pouring through the, the, you know, town plan and, and documents yourself? Like what's, what's your approach there? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the easiest thing is um, I, I find out what I can initially, you know, uh-huh. how big is it? Um, how many acres um, are utilities available? Um, what's the zoning? So, so what would be allowed in that location already? 
Um, that's all pretty basic information. Yeah. Um, from there, that's usually pretty easy to gather. Um, from there, then you have to start really digging in. So depending on what that zoning allows might depend how I do a tiny home community. Mm -hmm. So the zoning might allow RV parks. It might allow campgrounds. It might allow um, agritourism. It might allow ecotourism. Um, so there are many things that we can take and put a tiny home community that might fit um, what that zoning allows. So that's part of it is like, if, if we know that this is what this land will allow, we'll look at it like that first. Because quite yeah. frankly, trying to arm wrestle land into something that it's not currently allowed to be is expensive and time consuming. Um, it, it can be done and, you know, for the right property, we might pursue that. Um, but for the most part, there's so much opportunity out there right now where, you know, if it's, if it doesn't, if there's not something that we can just say, yes, this is allowed yeah. um, with some minor sign offs, but if we have to go through like a whole rezoning of a property and basically have it completely reclassified as something different to do anything, um, you know, that's one where it's like, oof, I just, that's, it's not even I don't want to do that. I, I don't want that fight. Somebody else yeah. can have that fight. I don't want that fight. Yeah, I mean, what I'm, I think that's really useful, even for for people who are not ever going to do a development, but are maybe just looking for one piece of land for their one tiny house, which is that, you know, rather than being attached to a specific town or place to kind of go out and search for a place that where it's almost allowed or it is allowed mm -hmm. and start looking for land there rather than starting with the specific land and saying, I want to make it allowed here. Yep. Yeah. And there's a ton of land mm -hmm. everywhere where you can put one. Yeah. Right. That's really, it, it's, you know, whether or not you can live in it. I mean, there's some, some little, little things, but sure. you know, th there's a lot of land where you're allowed to do it. Yeah. Um, in, in every state now, granted, you're not going to be close to a downtown. Okay. But, um, you know, most unincorporated, um, which most of the country is unincorporated. Uh, but most of the time when you're outside of city limits, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you're going to probably have some sort of option there to, to live in a tiny home. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. One, once you put more than one on a piece of property, now you kick in a whole different set of regulations. Yep. And now you're going to start getting into some trouble if you put more than one without permission. Got it. Got it. But it's all, it's all nuanced based very, on where you're at. Very nuanced and, and usually kind of buried in, in lengthy documents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so are the cottages uh, designed to be um, connected to kind of city water and sewer or is there any kind of off grid water? Yeah. Yeah, so we are um, currently, we're, we're just connecting all of the ones that we're building because they're going in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, a rainwater catchment and reuse system. Um, we have a composting toilet and a incinerator toilet. Uh, we also have a gray, gray water reuse system that um, is really cool because it actually collects the water in the home, filters it to the point where it can be fed right back into the home. Nice. Um, as opposed to just capturing it and using it in the garden or something like that. Um, so all of that technology exists and we're working on it. Um, but like I said, right now, my focus is ramping up the production. So we kind of, we, we, we pulled a, a, a Tesla and said, yeah, we're going to have all this great stuff, but you know, you might be able to get it in two or three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just because of demand, you know, we just have too many to build that we don't need that technology for. So we're kind of, we, we kind of announced it when we launched, but then had to table it just because we can't, you know, we can't keep up with what we got. And that just adds a whole nother wrinkle to production and, and engineering and all that kind of yep. stuff. So. Yep. Makes sense. Awesome. Well, Justin Draplin, thank you so much for, for being a guest on the show. It's a very impressive process project with with a great vision and and i appreciate you taking the time thanks for having me
Thank you so much to Justin Draplin for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including a complete transcript and lots of photos of the beautiful Eclipse Cottage at thetinyhouse.net slash 199. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 199. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.